Hi there, and welcome to another episode of Music Ally TV. And uh, today we're going to be talking to some cutting edge, ma cutting edge managers about uh, the way that they are working with artists at the moment and trying to bring in new opportunities and new income streams for them. Uh, now, for artists and fans, the music industry has evolved rapidly over the past two years. The impact of coronavirus was, of course, uh, a huge thing. But at the same time, new technologies that enable fan connection and new forms of income generation have matured and have been quickly adopted by fans and artists alike. Now, there are more ways than ever for an artist to connect with audiences and to make money while they do it. And this is the exact kind of complex task that many artists look to a manager to help them with. And here they are with us today. Now, at Music Ally, we've been speaking about this prospective third pillar of income for artists for a while. It's the substantial stream of income that comes in different increments, which sits alongside the traditional duo of live performance and recorded income, and is a unique mix of income streams for every artist. Uh, so for instance, an artist could make money from Twitch screen streams, a super fan club on Patreon, or a closely aligned and long-term brand partnership or a podcast, things like that. So how do the managers that work with those artists help them connect with their audience strike innovative deals and make money in new ways. So we're talking to three managers who are all navigating this new landscape and to find out what they've learned. They're all, by the way, members of uh, the Music Managers Forum's Accelerator Program, an initiative that was set up in 2019 with support from YouTube Music, Arts Council England and Creative Scotland to help upcoming managers to make, uh, uh, to become sustainable businesses. And they're all working with artists in very different and quite nuanced, cutting edge ways. So let's meet the managers. Uh, let's start first with Sarah from Muse Management, who works with uh, Shy Girl, Lisa, Butch, Lou Hater, Delilah Holiday, and uh, others. Uh, Sarah, thanks for joining us. It's nice to meet you. Thank you for having us. A, a pleasure. A pleasure. Uh, next, we have T. Oyalola from Black Grape Global, who works with Yolanda Brown, Genevieve Dawson, Anastasia Baker, and more. Hi, T. Hi, how you doing? I'm very well, all the better to see you. Thank you for joining Oh, well done. Ten points. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anytime, anytime. And last but not least, Ben Price of Harborside Music Management, who works with Victoria Modesta, Lachi, and Lucy May Walker, amongst others. Ben, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us. Cheers. Uh, pleasure. Right. Now, um, as I mentioned, all three are working with different artists in very different ways uh, and doing some very interesting um uh, projects with them that are, uh, are developing their brand, connecting with the world and making money in different ways. Before we touch on those, or perhaps to introduce that, let's go back to one of the first things I mentioned, and that was coronavirus, which of course is inescapable. Uh, at the moment, we're about 18 months into um, uh, the impact that it's having on, on our world. Um, let's sort of quickly bring us up to speed from, from the perspective of each of you in terms of how it affected your, your artists. What, what was the impact and how quickly did you have to make changes and how quickly uh, were you able to pivot to bring in new income and opportunities under that? And Sarah, let's go in the order that we introduced. Uh, so we'll start with you. Um, so my, my roster is really varied uh, with uh, different artists and different genres, different ages, uh, various fine bases and what they actually do. So uh, COVID had really different impacts on all of those and we kind of had to have different strategies depending on who and what they had. Um, I was wor I'm working with um, uh, DJs uh, that were heavily touring weekly various uh, uh, cities and countries and their income was 90% uh, you know, gigs. Uh, so the, the, um, for, for, for these, the, I think the decision was more to rather than eagerly try and find new ways of making money it was to like step back and enjoy you know time with their family something that they never had to do before so it was more of a okay let's step back and think what what best do we do here and um and you know they they focused on you know producing uh, uh writing albums and you know working on more creative things and and taking the time uh but on for some of the younger artists uh, uh it's quite quite interesting because uh, they're still developing. They didn't really tour before anyway. They did tour, but not that much. And because they're part of this new generation, uh, the whole fan base and career is actually based online. Yeah. So it's almost weird to say, but it almost didn't have an impact uh, on, on their career because, or it, if not positive, because everybody was at home on their computer. Right. So we yeah. got to do a lot of new things uh, that used... Uh, their creativity and uh, the fact that people were 
online and uh, all ears because there was nothing else to do. Right, um, interesting. Yeah, quite yeah. varied, but interesting. Yeah, interesting that it pushed them towards that creativity. It's interesting. Thanks, Sarah. And T, what about you? You 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 deal with a bunch of uh, very different artists. Um, oh, what, what was the impact? COVID-19 is something that no one could have predicted, you know. Um, the whole world stopped, you know, for once, which was in a way a blessing, you know, because mm -hmm. obviously I realised as a manager first, that for the first, since I was 16, I've been on the go, literally as a self-employed person. So it was nice to actually stop and breathe for a minute. Um, in a way, I've been quite blessed because with my clients, I've always thought about multiple streams of income in terms of their careers, you know, going into the worlds of broadcast, um, radio, TV, um, starting festivals and launching other brands or businesses within it. So with a lot of my clients, um, the income from live obviously disappeared. Um, but literally they had a parachute of their other income streams, you know, um, there to hold them up. Um, one of the newest clients I had taken on was a bit more difficult because we were just at the inception of building that multiple streams of income um, side of things. But the industry support in terms of grants and support really helped her through the initial stages. Um, but I've always thought multiple streams of income with my clients. So that was a big, big blessing for us. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks, T. Well, we'll dig into that in a minute. And uh, Ben, yeah, what about you? I mean, you have you have a, a similarly really wide range of clients, including a, a bionic pop artist. Um, so, how how what was the effect on on the artists you work with? Yeah, really varied again because of the diverse nature of the roster. Um, as you say, um, you know, for some artists, touring was was the main part of their income, and and obviously, as with everyone, we lost we lost all of that. Um, but I can sort of emphasise with what um, what Sarah was saying about the smaller artists um, who maybe don't make money from touring yet, although they do sort of gig. Um, it, it was kind of a not too not too different for them to be able to just sort of switch online um with one particular artist we um you know probably made up the income we were losing from live from from moving to twitch which was a, a new right. experience for us and um you know one that that actually turned out to be to be quite lucrative for them um it took some sort of persuading and, and getting into because you need to sort of really really be up for doing it i think to to build the fan base um, in that in that environment, but um, um, yeah, for, for some artists, definitely smaller uh, impact than some of the other artists I had who were you know had international shows lined up for the rest of the year. Um, yeah. As for how fast we pivoted, I mean, I think what T said was right. I think everybody took that opportunity to to maybe take a step back, and I think everybody liked this kind of thing that it was no longer a sort of rat race, and that everyone was on this equal playing field of nothing was moving. So let's kind of take some time out. I think that was cool. Um, you know, we I tried to, to make my eyes pivot um, probably quicker than they were sort of willing to. I'd say in the first instance, it kind of took a little while for everyone to realize that this is definitely a long term thing. But um, certainly, sort of by the spring, we were looking at lots of different income methods. Do you, I mean, that's, that's really interesting that one of the things you've all said is that it's everybody has taken, I mean, across society has taken a step back and they're reassessing their life and perhaps realizing that you use the word rat race, Ben, that they were in this sort of channel of just moving forwards and that was very clearly defined, but perhaps they hadn't questioned it. Do you think that artists now are perhaps more open-minded in terms of you know they're all sort of erring towards doing interesting new things anyway but do you think that as we move back towards a time where let's say live shows will be able to happen again fairly soon whatever fairly soon is do you think that actually we might see a world where artists are saying well i don't have to tour as much i, I mean uh, sarah i mean this might be something it's a with, with, with a dj based client base you know they, they are well known for being relentless in flying around the world um and do you think that some of them might be thinking a bit differently and thinking well perhaps i can do yes. virtual things yes absolutely there's something already you know when we are doing the strategy for when <laughs> for whenever it, it reopens uh, but we, we're just planning now you know for 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 the end of the year or for next year and the strategy is definitely quality over quantity and realize that actually i don't need to kill myself on the road anymore and we are just going to uh, to be very, very selective. And, and for other artists that are not DJs as well, it's like we're going to be a lot more selective on and say no a lot more rather than try and fill the calendar. 
Right. And and do, do you think that, I mean, we're hypothesizing here, but do you think that's sort of going to allow some really interesting, creative, non-live things? To, yeah, to I think our artists have just realized that they really enjoy being creative. Uh, of, of course, the, the type of artists I work with are quite uh, un underground and alternative anyway, but they have had this realization that they were always creative people, but then had didn't have time because of, I mean, the day to day logistics of a tour are just so time consuming for yeah. the team around them and for themselves. Uh, so realizing that now they have the time to, you know, being able to put all these ideas that they had in the back of their heads for ages and actually making them happen uh, is, is and, and realizing that actually, you know, they're, they're really into having their own video show or, or podcast yeah, yeah. because they always wanted to do that, but it was only, you know, a dream and now they can do yeah. it. So yeah, definitely. It's sort of, it, there's almost a redefining of the idea of performance, isn't it? It doesn't just mean being on the road. It could or, be or, or the redefining of, of themselves as artists, because yeah. they are artists before before all, not just DJs, you know, yeah. or, or, or singer or thing. They're, 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 they're full on creative entities. Yeah, yeah, mm. great. Uh, T, is that something you recognise across your roster? Yeah, I think, um, I remember one of my clients, um, specifically, she's a saxophonist. And I remember about 15 years ago saying to her, do you want to be like a Charlie Parker, you know, who you just know the instrument in and out and you're celebrated and adored for years to come? Or do you want to be someone who's maybe above average in terms of your instrument, but you've got multiple in income streams, you're into the world of TV and podcast and radio. And she said, the second person, she said, I don't want to be a geek on my instrument you know, as much as I love it, you know, yeah. and that allowed her during this season, actually, to be able to be okay, because she had multiple income streams, but also based on what Sarah said, it also, I guess, opened up her mind, and I guess with a lot of my roster into the idea of understanding your headspace and the way you feel is very important, you know, especially when artists, you know, you start off and you're very green-eyed in the industry, and you've got these um, goalposts that you're chasing towards while at the same time then some of them start to have families and have mm. children and then your objectives change you know so it's important to realize that also with artists as they grow and their lives change and evolve their careers also need to evolve you can't be on the road 200 days a year anymore yeah. so it's important to have other income streams that allow you to be at home and sleep in your own bed <laughs> you yeah. know yeah Always so, good, um, isn't it? yeah that, that was important I think during this season yeah, thanks, T. And Ben, you know, does this mean that do you have you found that the sort of the role of manager has changed a little bit? You know, you're you were saying you had to be, be a little bit persuasive for some of your artists to say, "Hey, try Twitch and invest fully into it to develop it as a, as an audience base." Is your role as manager then? Do you think it changes a little bit in, with, with, when you suddenly have a, a number of options in front of you? I think it does. I think I think. Um... You know, I've, I've always tried to sort of push my artists into unusual spaces anyway. So um, it just kind of gave that argument a bit more sway at the time. But um, yeah, I think the, the role has has changed somewhat. I think, um, you know, T sort of said a few of the points that, that I was going to make about, you know, as we touched on before, people started spending more time in the family. People started realizing that they, they liked being at, at home. And I think it made them realize that also uh, a bit more about sort of being aware of their own mental health and how much that mm, kind of mm. influences how creative they can be um you know it's it's almost a, a given that if a, a gig offer comes in as long as the you know the fee's decent it's just you know we'll do it we'll make it work but i think definitely in the future there's going to be a bit more um uh, i think people are going to be a, a, my artists will probably be a, a lot more selective because you know they're aware that if they they don't do that then they can work on this video shoot or whatever and they can make this even better and you know maybe we can monetize um the creative from the video shoot in a way and um, that kind of earns that money back or, or whatever do you, do you think that that's a sort of it, what we're shifting towards then is a bit more of a sort of long-termism view away from like quick uh, grab the money while you can hit the road be like james brown and just talk constantly and, and it, it, will it mean that so you're building a sort of more long-term <laughs> business investing in the future 
Well, it will, but I think you've got to remember as well that how long will that last before we're back to everyone's back to sort of that same old race again where everyone's kind of saying yes to everything. You know, I think at the moment people are are very much in sort of as much as obviously the industry suffered, I think, um, you know, that there is a side to it, which um, which which has allowed people to sort of breathe again and reset and and restructure, um, you know, either their business or their creativity. Um, I think uh, once we once we start up again, it'd be interesting to see how long that lasts before everyone's kind of back into the same way. I think that's a good point actually Ben made because it's funny, um, there's this beautiful idea of, oh yes, we're all creative again and we've all got this space, but at the end of the day, you've got to pay bills as well. Mm. And I think it's, I'm realising that now, that romantic honeymoon period of lockdown and COVID or whatever is starting to fade a little bit because the reality of I've got to pay bills is also key in the matter. So it always has, there always has to be an equilibrium, you know, between mm-hmm. being creative and chasing other income streams and the now, <laughs> you know, the yeah. I've got this to pay today, tomorrow, next week, you know, and that's the balance that I try and strike with my clients really is understanding. The thing is during lockdown, those bills were a lot lower because it was just mm-hmm. the rent. But when we have to travel and, and, and go to the restaurant and meet people and uh, just do all these things, then yeah, the, the bill goes up. So it's, it's yeah. quite relative, isn't it? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, this is perhaps something we can talk about in a year's time. Mm-hmm. If the, the mix has changed in terms of income streams, which actually neatly brings us on to our, our next question, which is, you know, when you're looking at building, like, let's say, a, a portfolio of income streams for an artist, you know, we're talking, obviously, recorded music income is going to still be there, live music income will be there in some um, form. But what are the, perhaps from the perspective of the clients, the artists you're working with, what are the income streams outside of touring and, and recorded music that you're particularly interested in, in as sort of building into their portfolio of earnings in the future? Um, let's, let's start with T this time. Oh, gosh. Um, the sky's the limit is the question. Um, it's not just, for me, it's not just limited to um, music only income streams. So I'll, I'll give you an example, actually, using my roster in terms of different things we do. So, for example, one of them, um, when I met her, um, she was a singer, but she's also a driving instructor. You know, so I was like, OK, because um, I guess the role of a manager is turning into more like a business manager. You know, so I was like, well, your business is about teaching people how to drive. But really, I feel the core business is you training other instructors to be driving instructors. You know, so I got involved in a company, got a percentage, and I've been able to build it now where she's training other driving instructors to teach. And she's making more money from that than actually instructing herself, which is subsidizing a music income. So there's no there's not more It's reduced the, the pressure of having to make money from touring, you know, because now she can say yes to a gig that's not paying well, but it's great for a profile because she's got money elsewhere. Right. You know, and then I've got another artist who runs festivals. You know, she's got two festival brands that she owns that are doing quite well and they're getting money from industry and manufacturers to buy stores and exhibi- exhibit at her festival. So it is honestly, it is so wide and, <laughs> and, and different for each client. Right. And, and, and have you as a sort of as a manager had to perhaps develop your skills to, to help those to help those artists in the way that they need? Oh, 100%. It's like, I feel almost like, you know, when you watch Dragon's Den, I feel like one of the dragons because in essence, I'm learning about their industries, but I'm also having to figure out what the holes are within the industry and using the skills for music and marketing to create opportunities for them within that space. You know, one of my latest clients, actually, there was a new space I'd never, ever dreamt of her working in, which is composing music for animation. Um, even though she was working within music, honestly, like we always have this blue sky thinking um, brain, brainstorm sessions, but I'd never thought about her making music for um, um, animation or film, but the opportunity came for Sesame Street and okay. it came during lockdown. So she's been doing that, you know, so it's just, it's, you develop and you learn all the time. And, and how do the artists feel? I mean, you're saying it takes the pressure off them a bit. I mean, do, do you think it then results in better creativity and better output in the medium term? The biggest problem with the music business is money. And any manager would tell you that whether it's emerging or managing like a Coldplay, 
you know, money is always the root of our problems. You know, when you're taking a new artist to even do a music video or pay for PR or release an album, you need money. So the moment you're able to figure out that problem first, then it makes everything else not easier, but it just makes it more manageable, you know, right. to push through. Um, but I'm sure um, Ben and Sarah will, will be able to um, add to that. It's money. Money is the biggest headache, really. Right. Well, let's, let's, let's ask Ben. Uh, ben, money uh, yeah. is uh, uh, cash rules everything around us. Um, but what like, when we talk about income streams, you know, which which ones are particularly either interesting to you in terms of alternatives to that duopoly, or what ones that you've you've worked with with your with your clients, your artists? Yeah, I mean, for us, the the, the NFT game was a was an actual game changer for us. Um, with with one of my artists, we were just before lockdown, we we practically finished a record, um, but um, but but not quite. Uh, it kind of went into holding pattern because we we also lost a lot of shows during that period um so you know when when nfts became a thing in the in the new year and because one of my artists the bionic pop artist she mentioned victoria modesta is very much a visual artist um you know we we investigated it and and put out um a video that was was quite famous for it, it was a sort of very cultural video she did for channel four around disability um back in 2013 um, so we we literally put a snippet of, of that up as a as an NFT and uh, with the, with the hope that it would sort of get us back in the studio and give us the marketing budget to finish the record, and we were quite surprised that it kind of went for for quite so much. It went for like uh, the equivalent of well, thirty ETH, which I think right now is sort of seventy three thousand dollars or something like that. So it kind of just opened up, it blew up the whole kind of thing for us and obviously that's now an area that we're investigating and and that's perfect for her because she's such a visual artist and she she, she you know everything she creates is very much art um and it kind of just gives us the assurance now where in the past we've looked at video music video shoots as 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 loss making without a doubt because you know she has very high standards and she's an independent artist um it gives us the assurance now that you know we can spend that money and 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 actually if we if we do it right we can utilize that market so that was the biggest one um but as i say my my roster's so diverse and we've, we've worked with twitch for one of my smaller artists and she started doing song commissions as well so on the side um you know looking to to, to write songs for fans as well and that kind of was a was a key sort of that, that, that's an interesting one, isn't it? About opening up that that process as an artist on Twitch. Was, yeah. Again, what would I th we'll talk to you about this in, in a second, Sarah? But it seems that obviously you have to be able to identify what the right opportunity is for every artist. You know, some artists, particularly ones who are already visual artists and, and in that technology space, NFTs are perfect for them. Other artists, it doesn't fit. You know, and and some are perfect for Twitch and others aren't. Mm -hmm. So when you talk to the artists who you you sort of encouraged to go on Twitch and, and to interact with her audience in a in a different way. How did they feel about that initially? How did they how did they go about that? I could show you the the email thread about this. It was it was long and tiring. Um, yeah. I actually, you know consulted with with someone I knew was doing very well out of Twitch, and they gave me this amazing. You've got to do it. This is what I do. This is how much I earn, and you know it takes some time, but it comes. You know it really sort of uh, makes a difference. Um, there was quite a long process trying to get this one artist to. What were their reservations? Um, I'm not actually to name them, but I'm saying what were what were the person? But what were their reservations about sort of transitioning to performance on Twitch? I think engaging? just because um, the, I mean the main the main uh, benefits of, of being on Twitch and the, the the way you would build an audience is definitely not by um, selling yourself as a as an original artist. I think you very much have to be up for playing majority covers because your fan base is fleeting it's just passing by so it's really a sort of equivalent of busking um i suppose you know it's it's online busking and you can throw in the odd original song but really um you know to get the sort of larger audiences it, it is more about doing doing covers so we tried to balance it in a way that wasn't like coming from our artist channels you know on facebook instagram yeah. or twitter sort of pushing people to that to that platform but actually to build a unique audience on twitch and then in turn try and convert them over to her yeah. their real right. interesting so it was it was kind of these were the conversations we were having in the process and um uh, and you know eventually we kind of 
made it work and I can't get her off there now so it's good. all right okay good happy ending to that story that's good okay and Sarah what about you I mean you, you you've with your artists you work in again a different way to to Ben and T and you, you some of the things you're doing are sort of brand collaborations and interesting um not just brand collaborations collaborations in general what are the interesting opportunities do you think there that are sort of I think, yeah so so brand, brand collaborations is definitely has been uh, the most important, uh, um, uh, but we've, you know, looked at so many different things. Uh, I think the brand collaborations definitely came kind of organically uh, as a follow-up of the time and money invested in developing uh, the artist brand. Uh, I think that that was kind of the main thing is like the main creative uh brand around the artist and then it just triggered interest from uh, various brand, whether it's for activations. We've done activations on the same as Twitch, uh, but they were uh, like sponsored or, uh, or other um, uh, kind of Instagram vi videos or thing, but um, until, you know, like billboard uh, uh, ad adverts, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, we We have tried to look at other things because we we were always interested it's never the goal it's not like let's make money now but it's you know let's let's uh, discuss what's possible um we have had like multiple um uh, meetings with things like patreons or even only fans so you know just kind of like everything on the side that's just like we can make your artist money uh, just do something and and you know we we had long meetings and discussed it the one thing we try to not do or why we didn't go for it is we wanted to avoid being gimmicky. It just felt like it's something that everybody was doing just because we had to do it. Same for, you know, paid live streams. Uh, it's something that, you know, from the start, we haven't been able to tour for. I think we had really, really successful EP come out and we couldn't tour it. So it was really frustrating. So we were looking at let's let's do, you know, a live online and we had different um, different approaches. There was like one really, really cool 3D world where all VR world and stuff. But every time we got to the point, it just, it was still a gimmick and it was still not pushing the boundary enough to just, or, or, or in, in the longer term. So we, we've seen those things, but we didn't get involved uh until because we, we we had yeah we had a look at patrons as well for ages and it's like we can only do it if we know we're there for the long term if we know the quality of the content we can give is as good as it can be we can't just go and just give the fans whatever they're getting already on soundcloud and I, uh, uh, instagram or you know it's, it's it has to be something completely different it would have to be a whole new team in charge of it it will have to you know be yeah. A lot of work so if we weren't able to commit to this we decided to not never but not now um uh, we did try uh, nft once which was quite a success as well but this as well was quite organic it was more a collaboration with a digital artist that was already doing this it was doing mm. a series of them and it was part of a wider series um and it was kind of like related so it was all kind of like part of a wider marketing related to instagram filters and in like loads of you know there's loads of different uh things um that led to it so it didn't feel like a you know one-off let's do a nft so it yeah. was more yeah. an extension of what was um it it did do really well and it was quite interesting to be part of of it uh it did trigger a bit of a of a conversation on Twitter as well for the uh, environmental issue around it. So right. yeah. I don't think we'll do it again, but uh, but it was quite it was quite an interesting um, experience, nonetheless. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, one of the things that right. um, is sort of is standing out here is that if you if you pick one of these other ways of connecting with the audience and bringing money in you you've all said you can't just play with it you have to really commit to it and understand exactly the route you're going down how then this is the, the million dollar question um is how do you help your artists identify the right path to go down 
to, to invest in? You know, the time or the money or the team. You know, these are these are big questions, aren't they? Um, ben, you know, you've you've mentioned a few different you know, you strong armed or gently persuaded an artist to uh, go onto Twitch, for instance, and and but then there's your NFT opportunity with um, your other artists that process of picking is quite important isn't it because you, you can't just dabble if, you, if you're going to do a patreon or only fans thing you have to really build a strategy around it so how do you do that how do you work with the artist to identify where to go i think it's a two-way street actually i think um, a lot of the time you know the artists will have their ideas on on what they will want to do as well and and it's about sort of guiding them into the right paths but um yeah, you do. You do have to tread tread carefully. I think, as Sarah said, you have to be sort of well up for it if you're going to do something like an OnlyFans or a Patreon. Um, you know, it can't just be a, a whim or a sort of money making idea. You have to really be committed to going down that path. But the artist has um, to be committed. More yeah, than then <laughs> if they're not up for it. You can't actually persuade them. I mean, Twitch was a was a different story. It was a sort of lesser commitment. But if you if you're going to go down a um, a path of sort of doing NFTs regularly and working with visual artists. There's a, there's a lot of work that goes into that. So, um, but like I say, I think I think I would say it's definitely a two way street, and that um, you know you usually get a vibe of of um, or you should you should obviously have a vibe of the directions your artists want to go in. And I think um, it's kind of persuading them softly to do the right things, but ultimately they they have to decide because if they're not up for it, it just won't work. And that lends to so the idea of authenticity, doesn't it? it? It needs to look and feel and sound and be believable to fans and audiences and the artists, doesn't it? Uh, T, what about you? Are we? Is this sort of shifting a little bit the idea of what an artist is? In, are we moving towards the idea that an artist should be cross-discipline? They, they, if you are an, if you are going to be a successful artist. It can't just be about songs and performance. It has to be about songs, performance, and this other thing, which could be NFTs or it could be uh, live streaming or anything. I think so. I think if you want to have a long career in music, it's the music business, you need to figure out other ways to make money, literally. Um, I know there's artists who have made money and started music venues in London, you know, like um, Omira and the rest of them. You know, you have artists who've made money and started a chain of hotels you know, like Malmaison, <laughs> you know. So I think, or started like well, a drink, um, a alcoholic drink or beverage. So I think it's quite important with your artists to think blue sky and to also realize that you don't need to be one of the A-list artists to think like that. You can start thinking like mm -hmm. that now. You know, with one of my artists, I'm seriously trying to, because she's quite well known within the children and family space that's really emerging and growing. And I just feel like she would absolutely smash it if she started a nursery, a chain of nurseries, um, quite bougie, you know, kind of a nursery that's um, really like heavily, her. yeah, exactly, really <laughs> heavily um, invested in music, um, getting people in as well to come and do workshops with the children. Um, but she's not quite into it at the moment because she feels like if anything goes wrong, it will affect a whole brand, which is very true. You know, so it's also how do you balance that? You know, how do you use the leverage of her name with a brand like that, but still not have it at risk of it being damaged if something goes wrong? You know, so it's it's managing all of that, I feel. Yeah. Uh, what about you, Sarah? I mean, the, the, you, you're dealing with artists, perhaps, you know, DJs and producers who are... I mean, all artists are brands, but DJs and producers are very particularly brands, aren't they? They, 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 they are. They have a. They're very sort of. Um, you know who they are and what you're getting, and and that's part of that world. So, how is that sort of? How it, does that give you an opportunity to leverage those artist brands into other things? And are are, are your artists perhaps very used to looking down different paths yeah, in terms of uh, being multifaceted? I think. Um... I don't think the artist needs to be like uh, cross discipline, but I feel like for an artist to be successful by nature, uh, before even their music skills, they have to be creative entertainers and, you know, have to take the space where they're in the room, they, you know, take the spaces like, obviously not every artist, I'm talking about the superstar stereotype, you can totally have a really long 
a prosperous career being a background producer and not doubling in anything else it's absolutely fine but if we're talking about the archetype of superstar artists um they i think is it will just be natural to them that they'll thrive at whatever um endeavor they 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 get involved in yeah yeah and what about fans? I mean, we've talked about the artists. Of course, your job is to connect artists with audiences. And you know, the, the, the changes that we're talking about and these new ways of connecting and new opportunities are very important to fans as well. And they are changing in what they expect of artists. So, Sarah, what have you sort of, and we'll go around everybody with this one, what, what, are you, what are you spotting that the fans are sort of demanding or expecting now from, from their artists? <laughs> they demand a lot. Yeah. <laughs> they're very vocal and they want a lot of content. They're like, they're never content. <laughs> it's just like, here's right. another one. They're like, when's the next one? <laughs> uh, but, but they are very interactive. There's a real relationship between the artist and uh, they're, they're in touch with the artist a lot more than they've ever been, I think. Uh, whether it's on Twitter, Instagram, we've, we've started Discord channels uh, where we don't even have to be on it. It's just between them. The fans are just, you know, just developing this conversation around the artist all the time. And uh, yes, they are asking for collaborations a lot, but I find it super, very superficial. It's just, you know, they're asking collaborations with the exact same artist in another country or the exact, it's just things. Um, I, we always thrive to, you know, provoke the fans and give them the unexpected. So it's, yeah. it's a, it's a it's a conversation, but it's always for the benefit of the creativity of the artist and the mental health to just put a kind of felt panel just in front of them and just say, you know, we're we're here and we li listen, but also this is what you're getting. <laughs> that I mean, that's something that's very important important point, isn't it? Which is you, your your job is to sort of balance between giving the audience what they want, but also looking after the artist and giving the audience something they didn't know they wanted but they wanted more exactly. than what they thought they want yeah. and yeah. um you know that's uh, that is a balance of, of uh, the artist's abilities and, and, and health and opportunities as well and is that you artists perhaps who are sort of newer do they do they find that quite difficult to navigate in terms of do they when their their relationship with fans who are, can be very enthusiastic let's say it, it really depends on the artists there. They all have completely different relationships with fans. Some people literally prefer not to be involved at all on social media and don't really get it. Or, and some people just thrive in the conversation with the artist and on Twitter 24 seven and just, you know, conversing and, and building that, that conversation with the, with this hardcore fan base stuff. I feel like the smaller the artists, the more hardcore the, this fan base is because they are they're the, the, the early adopters. So they're, they're really like, you know, yeah. geeks, <laughs> but, uh, but they're the best. And they're the, they're the ones that, you know, we, we really thrive to, uh, to keep happy and, and, and to make sure they're important for on the longer term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, uh, Sarah. And T, what about you? You know, you, you're dealing with art. That on that fan side, what have you identified that fans want? You know, you're, oh, you're looking at opportunities across the board that you've mentioned there. What, what, what do fans want and how do you deliver it to them in perhaps non-traditional ways? What do fans want? I'm, I'm always blown away when I hear um, Sarah speaking of a managers about fan base, you know, um, having meetings with record labels and they're like, who's your fan base? You know, I always find that question really difficult to answer for my roster of artists because the artists that manage, I wouldn't necessarily say they have fans in that sense of the word, you know, but they have an audience, you know. Yeah. I don't think they have um, fans that would start like a, a fan group and they would meet up and talk about the artist or, or share stuff. They don't have that. They just have people that come to their gigs. I don't know if you'd still relate to them as fans, um, but they tend to be older. They tend to be between the ages of 30 and above, you know, mm -hmm. and um, they'll come to a gig and they'll spend a hundred pound on merch. You know, they buy vinyl and T-shirt. Um, mm -hmm. I remember with one of my clients, um, we launched a brand um, called Posh Reggae. Um, it was just a joke. We didn't think anyone would care about it. Um, and we printed some T-shirts out just to test 
print of um, 100 t-shirts and we sold it out at the first gig and since then they're now bags and and t-shirts and hoodies and you know literally that paint I remember we went to Australia on tour um four years ago and the merchandise from the tour paid the band and everything else all the expenses you know so it's um for me but then I wouldn't call them fans because they wouldn't necessarily meet somewhere online yeah and if she was doing like a live stream you wouldn't have 5,000 of them try and find her or you know it's quite it's quite interesting. Do you think that's do you think that's a sort of uh, um in in this newer sort of technologically driven environment where anyone can discover anybody any any audience member can discover any artist do you think actually that, that artists are going to have more of these sort of if you like floating fans who who are going to engage on something not just be this hardcore geek fan base but are engaging on a different way? Oh, I think so definitely. And to me I'm quite a realist I'm an, an, I'm a numbers person as much as I'm a big dreamer I'm also a realist and I love the idea that sometimes we look at the industry and we can get um distracted by the the big numbers and what we need to achieve but actually if you strip it back down if I have an artist and he or she has an audience of a thousand in different territories around the world they could make a very good living and be very comfortable from that you know and make great impact you know, whereas when I first started as a manager, I felt that, oh, gosh, you've got to have a top 10 in the charts and a million streams a year. And, you know, that's what all my thinking was. That's what I was conditioned to think as a manager. But my thinking has changed. And I think it's just about being sincere and transparent with you as an artist to be able to connect with people so they see you and get to know who you are. And then the rest of it just kind of, kind of falls in place because they love you as a person, yeah. which means that anything you're selling they buy into because they buy into mm -hmm. you as a brand. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, thanks, T. Ben, what about that part then? This idea that you know, whether they're fans or an audience, what the do you think that what people are actually connecting with is okay, it's the music and it's it's all those things, but it's it's the the individual and how they communicate what they're about. I think that's that's kind of always been the case though i don't think uh, any any of the sort of recent developments have changed that people um want to get a sense of the personality of an artist and um you know i, I think just touching back on a previous point being multidisciplined, i think does help get get your your kind of um, um personality across in in very different ways and i think that's important in building the fan base but and and also to kind of answer the question of um, what do fans want I think we can we can analyze what they um, you know all the what all these recent changes have, have, have made and and some of the income streams we've discussed um, you know a lot of them aren't actually aimed at, at developing the fan base in an immediate sense but very much you know in terms of the stuff I've discussed like the NFT um, world you know it's selling to art collectors rather than fans in, in terms of what, what we've done so far. Um, so that's enabling us to then continue to provide content and, um, and and music for the for the fan base. So you have to be careful with some of these streams not to get sort of too too involved in them. Although it's great to have that multidisciplined um, approach and to build that fan base in maybe an art world, you still then got to reflect back to um to, to the audience because at the end of the day the audience as much as they may sort of embrace technological advances ultimately they still want content and they still want in real life experiences they still want to be they'll still want to be going to gigs like they always were you know come the end of this year i'm sure of it and they still want content they want good videos they want interactions with their with their fan bases so although we're kind of there's there's these great ways of bringing more income in i think we have to sort of keep our eye on the ball that it's still the it's still the, the content and the, the presence that the, the fan base actually want. I was right. going to well, say, uh, actually, yeah. um, sorry, Ben, spot on with that, actually, is the balance between both. Mm -hmm. um, but also, speaking about the live issue that Ben just topped on, um, touched on, is that there's also, like, I found this quite fascinating because as a manager, I've, I've also had to wear the hat of promoter, you know, many mm -hmm. times um, for my clients. But what I find quite interesting is there's actually only a certain percentage of the population that goes to gigs you know so there is a big untapped audience that have never been to you'll be shocked but they've never been to a live music venue in their life they don't understand the culture of going to a gig buying tickets online and all of that so it's also figuring out ways to tap into that market because 
it could be oversaturated, especially with lockdown and COVID and everything that's happened. It's like everyone's now trying to get into theatres. Everyone's trying to gig. So if you're targeting that same niche audience that are used to going out, how much income do they have to go to everyone's gigs and buy everyone's new albums? So I guess as managers, we have to also evolve into thinking, how do we tap into that percentage of population that don't currently go to gigs and get them out into venues? You know, so um, yeah. So there's, there's actually a, there's actually a, a big opportunity waiting, oh, and and, the, and these new perhaps technologies or ways of connecting are gonna gonna enable that, which is really exciting, isn't it? Well, look, I think we could talk about this all day, uh, but uh, I'm gonna have to uh, wrap things up soon. But perhaps just before we go, I'd be I'd be interested as a sort of a quick thought from each of you, and what what are the opportunities that you're really excited by when you look forward from the perspective of perhaps your artists or in general what in terms of ways of connecting things for them to do uh something that really excites you and uh difficult question so let's start with uh, ben well a lot of the things we've discussed really um excite me i think the technological about technological advances sorry are um a uh, 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 very sort of exciting in many aspects with with Victoria you know um, digital fashion is something we're looking at a lot and I think that's a really exciting space for us um, you know we've just we've just created an avatar for her which is going to be used in a lot of music videos and a lot of things so just taking advantage of all these things that are available to us um, I think one of the, the key things for me is try to be an early adopter of, of, of all the technological tech <laughs> you can have to edit this. Easy for you to say <laughs> I think it's um, important that people sort of are an early adopter for technological advances. I think um, it's uh, it's great to sort of be on the ball with these things early and, and see if they can work for your artists. And I think, um, you know, that, that's what kind of excites me is, is getting in, in on early on some of these things and, yeah, yeah. Um, and seeing where they can go. Good, good. Thanks. And uh, let's save Sarah for last uh, tea. Oh gosh, what's exciting? I think what's exciting is navigating this very unique terrain we're in, um, this unique season, um, and figuring out the gaps um, and new ways to do things. Um, for me, with my current roster, is to continue to develop the multiple streams of income, going especially into the worlds of broadcast. Um, that's been quite successful for a few of my clients, actually, radio and TV presenting. Um, going into the podcast world as well which yeah. even though it's extremely oversaturated at the moment there's still a space and ways mm. to monetize it so that's really fun um, more than anything actually I think for me what's super exciting at the moment is the whole children and family space because I feel like there's a real big thing going on there with Spotify kids um, YouTube kids um, um, there's a there's a real space there a lot of labels are starting the visions just focused on that as well so it will be really great to see how we can really stamp our flag in the sand in that area. Yeah, yeah. great. Thanks, T. And uh, Sarah, last but not least. Um, yeah, I think collaborations, collaborations and collaborative um, opportunities with uh, all sorts of uh, sectors and, you know, musicians, other musicians, other artists, other stylists, painters, chefs, just really like collaborating and creating things uh, as far as we can. And uh, another thing that we haven't really done yet, but that could be really, really interesting is to go uh, towards movies and TV and mm -hmm. um, first make maybe making music uh, for those outlets and uh, hopefully maybe like acting something. I don't know, just, right. yeah, but really, really like go, going uh, visual. Right. Okay. Yeah. Which makes sense in, in the current climate, of course, doesn't it? Of the highly visual uh, more than ever age. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Well, uh, like I say, we could carry on talking forever, but we must uh, must stop at some point. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to uh, Sarah, Ben and T for joining us. Really fascinating stuff. I'll put some links below this video um, to um, the MMF program that I mentioned earlier, and also some of the news reporting we've done recently on all the topics we've discussed, like NFT and uh, uh, making artists' brands extend to other places and things like that. Uh, and obviously, of course, link to Sarah, Ben and T as well, if you want to check out uh, their online presence. So uh, that's it uh, from me, Joe Sparrow, here in uh, Berlin. And uh, thanks for joining us and uh, see you soon. Thanks for having us. See you soon. <laughs>